My lords, my lady, um, before lunch, I, I said I was going to move on to address you on the policy uh, yeah. rationale which inspires uh, these uh, regulations. And um, the way it's put by my learned friend for the local authority, that uh, the policy was to encourage people to move to more suitable property. That's in her skeleton at paragraph 24. Um, now, what I say about that is that that is a rather vague ambition. A property can be more suitable in a very broad range of respects. Its size, its location to family, its location to public services, uh, its configuration... In fact, in my submission, the policy materials strongly suggest that the aim was more focused and that it was focused on the perceived vice of under-occupation rather than the broader category of mis-occupation. Um, What's the difference? Misoccupation can relate to, it can easily be said that one family has a, uh, would be in occupying a property doing it more efficiently than another for a range of reasons. So one might say, well, that's very handy for their grandma who pro provides very vital services uh, in uh, sustaining the family in work. Or uh, that property is extremely well adapted uh, for the physical disability needs of uh, somebody because it's got uh, uh, um, uh, uh, grab rails and a, uh, a wet roof. Um, it can also be said that, and I've accepted this throughout, that a family who have uh, two teenagers of... Uh, heterogeneous sex, so a boy and a girl, have an extra need that the Hockley boys uh, don't have. There's a reasonable expectation of privacy that older children and adults have, where uh, older children and adults of different sexes aren't expected to share facilities. So, uh, likewise, one sees small children in a swimming pool changing room uh, uh, brought by their, their mum or their dad, older children would be uh, in sex-segregated uh, facilities. There's, there's nothing surprising about that. But what I say is that it's an aspect of uh, the much broader range of reasons why one property might be more suitable than another, rather than the particular focus on under-occupation. And I'm going to take you to a, a couple of places in the evidence where uh, what is apparent, as suggested by the description of the policy as abolition of the spare room subsidy, that that was the <coughs> focus. So um, the, uh, both of my opponents rely on Carmichael, and in fact I say Carmichael rather uh, supports us at Paris 16. I, I shan't take you to it, I'll just quote the very short passage. <coughs> the government aimed to ensure that social sector tenants of working age who were occupying premises with more bedrooms than they required should, wherever possible, move into smaller accommodation. It focuses on size rather than configuration. Um, the Secretary of State, as uh, my learned friend for the Secretary of State has uh, said, filed evidence I invite you to turn to page 225 of the supplementary bundle, which, uh, <coughs> at which you'll find paragraph 14a of her statement. This is the paragraph that Mr. Brown took us to. Uh, I think, yes, I, I, I think he may have done. I, um, I, I, I'm not sure that he... We were listening to him, even if you weren't, Mr. Royston. <laughs> Over the page... Yes. Uh, the 
Uh, so 14A begins encourage more effective use of social housing. Put very generally, many housing benefit claimants live in accommodation which is larger than they reasonably <coughs> need. And then over the page, I'm not sure you were uh, uh, taken to this, the reduction in housing benefit for claimants under-occupying their property. And again, there the reference is to under-occupation rather than misoccupation. Under-occupying their property was designed and continues to encourage claimants to move to more suitably sized accommodation. So there's no dispute about the Secretary of State being partly animated by a policy of altering uh, the use of social housing. But as the Upper Tribunal observed, that itself doesn't get the Secretary of State anywhere, because the question remains, well, to what extent? And what's important is to recognise that there's no possible argument that the Secretary of State was uh, trying to uh, make maximally efficient use of social housing, as can be seen from the fact that I, I pointed it out in my skeleton. Um, the, the, the bedroom tax, the, the, the abolition of the spare room subsidy, <laughs> applies only to working age families. So a pension age couple, or, sorry, a pension age individual, could be living in a four bedroom house on his own and will not be subject to uh, uh, any reduction in his rent. But so what? We all know that pensions are the darlings of the government. Yeah, well, and the, the, what it emphasises is that the Secretary of State rightly has had regard to a range of social considerations rather than uh, efficient occupation being such an animating purpose that it drives anything else out of the way. Because what the Secretary of State says is, well, it's more efficient to have uh, the Hockleys replaced by a notional family where that look very similar, but one of them's a girl. Um, or both of them are over 16, or, or sorry, what, at least one of them is over 16. Um, but we can see from the approach to, for example, pensioners, that recognition of the adverse impact of expecting people to uh, putting people under pressure to move away from property or to live below subsistence benefit levels is an important <coughs> countervailing factor. There's an additional uh, significant uh, point to be taken from the uh, evidence at page two of the supplementary bundle. Uh, this is the second page of the impact assessment Again, I note in passing that the, uh, on page one, this document uses the same formulation, providing an incentive to more, move to more suitably sized accommodation. That's Where page, is that? That's, sorry, that's page one of the same document. Where on page one? Uh, uh, the uh, second box that begins, what are the policy objectives and the intended effects? Line three. Yes. Currently living in accommodation which is currently considered too large for their needs. And the, the critical point about the Hockleys, of course, is that uh, are on the, the assumed facts of this uh, case at least, they're not in accommodation that's too large for their needs. They're in, in accommodation that's exactly large enough, it's misconfigured uh, from the Secretary of State's perspective. That, that there is space to sleep four people in the house. Yes. And there are four people in the household. But uh, those four 
it would have, but the bedrooms would have to be larger. Yes. Yes. But, but um, they couldn't be accommodated in two bedroom camps. Yes. On the basis that, and, and this isn't as, as stupid as it sounds, but on the basis that um, a two bedroom house is smaller than a three bedroom house, if, 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 if size is uh, um, uh, governed by such factors, um, they are in two larger houses. Well, the. In fact, that, that, that may not actually work particularly well on the facts, because the, the suggestion is that what uh, as my Lord, Lord uh, Longmore uh, said earlier, that at, at some point a dividing wall has turned. But the fact that the, 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 the agreed facts are there are three bedrooms in this house. Yes, but yeah. it's not about that, but, but that's, that, that's about configuration rather than size. Um, the, I, I accept in general the average three-bedroom house will be larger than the average two-bedroom house. But, that, but that's what, that's, we come back to the property point, that bedrooms are only a property for the size of the house, but they are a property for the size of the house. Um, and um, the Hockley family can, could be accommodated in a two-bedroom house. That's the, that's the whole yes, in, of the in, case. In, in theory, because there aren't the, uh, the, the privacy issues. Um, the, but they don't. But it's not because they need. If you compare the Hockley family to a, a notional comparator, where, uh, the, for example, there's a boy and a girl, it's not because they need any more space. It's not because they need a larger property. It's that they need a differently configured property, and that's why the, the references to largeness are. Uh, but but, but un, under um, uh, subparagraph five, uh, if there are um, a, a couple uh, with um, uh, two children uh, who um, are of two different sets, a boy and a girl, uh, they require three bedrooms. Yes. Um, if, uh, as in the Hockley household, there are two children of, of, of who are the same, they require, un, under paragraph five, just looking at the categories here, Two bedrooms. Therefore, if if, if 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 two families are in these houses, um, uh, a couple and a boy and a girl with two bedrooms uh, and the Hockleys, if they swapped, uh, they would be but what, uh, both in the in the right place. But what they require are two bedrooms, which. Um, are sufficiently sized yeah. when we're looking at their, their actual needs. Two bedrooms sufficiently sized to, to fit them. Um, I, I accept in time. Yes. But under five, just looking at the categories, that's what they need. Two bedrooms. Yes. Well, and the, the question is: Do it is the the notional advantage of uh, putting families like the Hockleys under pressure to live on a as they had to before. So, sorry to, to interrupt, but in, in, in the example that I gave, it's not a notional advantage because the other families which I referred are currently living in inappropriate accommodation. Well, I say. One of living in the same bedroom. I, I, I say it's notional because th th there's not an actual family identified. The, the local, as my learned friend said, the, the local authority hasn't identified alternative accommodation that it can actually put her in. Um, it, it, all that will happen to the Hockleys immediately is that uh, their rent will cease to be paid in full. Um, that's the only thing that directly follows, that whether in fact there exists another family who are willing to swap uh, or, or whether alternative accommodation can be found it, it is notional in the sense that um, that it might happen, but uh, it has, certainly can't be shown to be to be definite. But, but the, uh, um, uh, the cut in the um, housing benefit provided uh, would be an incentive for them to move to uh, a two-bedroom house, because there they would get full housing benefit for the full rent. Yeah, if so they well, it, if if they could find one, but of course the. Um, the, the no, no, 
an incentive uh, to move to a, 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 a more suitably designed accommodation? Well, it's only, it's only an incentive if, the, if there is something actually available. But, but we know that a housing tenant benefit doesn't specify property that you're entitled to live in. It's simply a benefit. Well, let me... All, all I'm saying is you, you, you're focusing on uh, incentive to move to a more suitably sized accommodation. Yes. It seems to me that that's what the scheme does in the hospital case. If, if Mr. Brown's right. Well, it, I, I accept in a sense it's, um, it would be more... It, it would be more suitably configured uh, accommodation. Where, with respect, I, I don't accept your lordship's uh, proposition, is, it, is that that relates to size. But that's because you don't accept the fundamental proposition of Mr. Brown that, that a bedrooms is a proxy for size. You simply don't understand. I understand it's the heart of your submission. But the, but the policy documents aren't looking at uh, proxy at this stage, that they're outlining what's the motivating the logic. It's a, he wants us to look at page two. Which we yes. Got um, the, 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 the bottom paragraph, key assumptions, demonstrates that uh, the Secretary of State accepts if all existing social sectors <coughs> wish to move to accommodation of an appropriate size. There would be a mismatch between available accommodation and the needs of tenants. So it concedes that there's not just a problem in that if people actually respond to this alleged incentive, uh, it won't save any money. And the, the, the headline uh, purpose of the policy is saving money. Um, that the headline purpose is saving money must be predicated on a recognition that many people will not respond to any incentive. But it goes further than that in this paragraph and accepts that it, it's not even theoretically possible because the, um, that, that's not how our nation's accommodation is. There would be a mismatch between available accommodation and, and the needs of tenants. That gives the Secretary of State certainty, I suppose, that, um, that this policy will save money. And the question uh, then arises has the Secretary of State shown that this money is being saved in a non-discriminatory fashion? The um, I, I, I've taken your uh, lordships, your ladyship, to uh, a, a number of references to uh, size, more bedrooms than are. Um, needed and made reference to the, the, the public presentation of the policy as being about yes. spare bedrooms. Um, the Secretary of State in argument has already referred to um, lodgers plainly being inapplicable. Um, now, it's important again to recognise that the inapplicability of lodgers to the Hockley has nothing to do with their personal election or, or, or their personal circumstances. It's not that, for example, there's a particularly sensitive child who would uh, react badly to being a stranger in the house. Um, there's, there's just nowhere to put a lodger, and they wouldn't, even if they could find somewhere, I, I think I said in my skeleton, if, if a child slept in the kitchen, even then, it wouldn't get them anywhere because their landlord doesn't let them uh, have any... It, it, it has a maximum occupancy of uh, four. The... significance of this is that when the Secretary of State has... Uh, contemplated the uh, situation of mitigation by uh, a, a reference to lodgers. There hasn't been any recognition that there's a category of persons to whom this won't be a possibility. Um, so 
uh, I'll take you directly to the passage rather than uh, cite my uh, skeleton. In the supplementary bundle, page 217 um, has the sponsoring minister's uh, comments in Parliament. Paragraph at the top of 217 begins, one thing that people will be able to do is offer spare rooms to lodgers, which in some cases will be a sensible option. Uh, and then it, it uh, parades the, the very significant benefits of being able to take in lodgers. So uh, you're no longer uh, bedroom taxed, but you also can uh, obtain extra income from uh, the presence of the lodger because of the, uh, the, the way in which lodger income is disregarded. That's undoubtedly a significant and useful uh, measure to be able to rely on. But there's no analysis or even bare contemplation of having structured the legislation in a way that prohibits resort to that for uh, this class of persons. But uh, this case isn't about uh, uh, applicability for lodgers at all, is it? I'm not sure we're going to get very much assistance from that kind of consideration. Um, just going back to the impact assessment on page five, uh, surely this is in many ways the critical document for uh, the policy rationale, uh, which is dealt with on page five. And... Um, uh, uh, in paragraph four, it says the current policy um, uh, is that eligible rent levels are not currently determined by reference to the size of the claimant's uh, uh, household. And then in paragraph five, it says that it, from now on it's going to be, and that the uh, um, uh, applicable maximum rent will be reduced depending on the number of spare rooms in the household. Well, that's a fairly sort of uh, a good indication, isn't it, of the policy? Yes. Yeah. Well, and I, That's and what I should guide us if anything is and, and, and I say that the, the, the reference to spare rooms is strongly supportive of my uh, position because th uh, a household with the Hockley's characteristics cannot be said to have a spare room in uh, at Wisteria Way. Um, the uh, it, it's worth also considering particularly as that my opponents both rely on the, the, the facts of Carmichael quite significant, worth considering what the Carmichael situation was, because uh, I've said in my skeleton, um, we say it's actually um, rather helpful to us. The Carmichaels were a couple in a two-bedroom property. And Mrs. Carmichael had very uh, <coughs> significant uh, disability. Now, particularly in the case of uh, children, there might sometimes be something about disability that means that a person can't share a room can't reasonably share a room with them. Perhaps one child with very significant behavioural problems might be so difficult or even dangerous in the night that the parents couldn't safely have another child in the room with them. Nothing of that in the Carmichael situation. Um, and, and it would be extraordinary fact if, if, if there were. The Carmichael's didn't have space for what they needed. Mrs. Carmichael had special uh, equipment and uh, I think a special bed. 
uh, perhaps that could be raised or lowered uh, appropriately. Uh, this is dealt with, the, the Carmichael fact to summarise very briefly in the appendix to the judgment. Um, I, I shan't take you to it unless you um, want me to. Um, the Carmichaels were not in a situation where a one-bedroom property would have to be unsuitable to them. If it was a big one-bedroom property, they could have happily lived in that. They might well have, I, I mean, I don't know, they might well have positively preferred that to being in separate rooms. It's not at all unusual to expect the husband and wife, if at all possible, would wish to uh, be co-located in the same bedroom. So what, what, what's the, I'm sorry, what's the point of this submission? What, what's the... What the, um, the, the court found that the availability of discretionary housing payments and the availability of transfer to a different, more suitably constructed property didn't justify excluding, reducing the rent, the, 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 the housing benefit, payable to the Carmichaels. That there needed to be provision such that they were able to continue occupying their two-bedroom property with no reduction in rent, even though exactly what your Lordship has correctly pointed out can be said of the Hockleys, could be said of the Carmichaels. They could uh, imagine somebody, two unrelated adults having to share a big one-bedroom flat and the Carmichaels in their two-bedroom flat. The Carmichaels could go to the one-bedroom flat I'm not sure that's right, because the, the, these two boys, the Hockley boys, can, can share a room if, if it were big enough. Yes. But it, 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 in the Carmichael's case, paragraph 44, Mrs. Carmichael cannot share a bedroom with her husband. Well, th that's predicated on... The, the reason I've referred to the... Um, the fact at the end. The fact at the end is to explain <laughs> that that's rather by way of shorthand of an assumption about... What strictly it means is she can't share her bedroom with her husband because there's nothing about the facts of Mrs. Carmichael's case that shows that she wouldn't be able to share a bedroom with her husband. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I mean, no doubt. I mean, if the well, me, Mr. Brown and I were, were both in um, uh, uh, Carmichael and Daly and Rutherford. I, I don't remember anything about. Um, her circumstances that meant that it would be said that there was no property where she could share a bedroom with her husband. But uh, it, 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 in my submission, the factual summary of the Carmichael case indicates that it's property specific. The point is they can't share a bedroom, and that's what's reflected in the legislative amendment, which provides for couples who cannot share a bedroom. So. There's no fact specific in the inquiry as to whether there's a very large studio or anything of that nature. It's as my board will just as Hickman can set out. They can't share a bedroom. That's the assumed fact of Carmichael. And, and, and um, hence, hence the um, reference to Gobby as well. Yes. Where the children couldn't share a bedroom. Indeed. No matter how big it was. And hence ZA, ZB, and BA of the regulations. Yes. That's how it's provided for. Well, <laughs> as I, 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 I don't think I can do more than. Uh, repeat the submission I've made, but it, it simply doesn't work on the facts to say they can't share a bedroom. Um, the, 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 the assumed facts are as set out in Appendix 1, and there's nothing in those assumed facts uh, yeah. that leads to the conclusion that they can't share a bedroom. So that's the point, is it? Yes. Thank you. Um, let me turn now to uh, the uh, issue of, oh, I'll, just forgive me for one moment, I'll 
just see whether there's one more thing that I want to say about policy before I move to discrimination. Oh yeah, I'll just briefly um, make a reply to what the local authority says about the, the um, supposed practical burdens of the upper tribunal's decision. Um, submissions are made to you, but through council skeleton and oral submissions, that it would be impractical to uh, apply the legislation in the way that the upper tribunal uh, has found that it should be. The local authority hasn't filed evidence to uh, support that, either here or uh, uh, below. And it doesn't appear, in my submission, to be a point made in the Secretary of State's evidence. And the reason for that is that all that really has to be asked is, is there a reason why your sharers, your two kids of the same sex or your you know, whoever, can't share? And that has to be asked anyway, because uh, there, there may be, as uh, my Lord Lord Hickenbottom points out, uh, th th there may be, in the case of children, uh, behavioural reasons, for example, why children can't share uh, a bedroom. Um, and this is also an appropriate point to briefly highlight the repeated uh, <coughs> comments from the higher mainstream courts, both here and uh, in the Supreme Court, uh, about the, the, the institutional competences of the, the different parts of our judicial system. And so I've... Um, referred right at the end of my skeleton to the cases of Jones um, and Cook. Um, and um, the, 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 the deference the higher <coughs> courts give to the expert tribunal um, is inevitably less uh, when, it, when the issue is one of uh, construction. I, so well, it's not, it, it's not um, completely uh, set aside, but it's inevitably less. Well, I, I accept that, um, but the two cases that I uh, cited, Jones and Cook, uh, are cases of statutory construction. Uh, Jones says it's primarily for the tribunals, not the appellate courts, to develop a consistent approach to these issues, bearing in mind they're peculiarly well fitted to determine them. Uh, and then in Cook, uh, the commissioners will know how that particular... Uh, issue fits into the broader picture of social security principles as a whole, they'll be less likely to introduce distortion into those principles, they may be better placed where it's appropriate to apply those principles in a purposive construction of the legislation in question, they will also know the realities of tribunal life. Um, the, uh, and that's an argument as to why this tribunal should have preferred to the previous tribunal, namely Nelson. Well, w what I've said about uh, Nelson it is that uh, the tribunal in Hockley correctly identified that it was actually tackling a different question, the question of bedroom entitlement to bedrooms rather than... The well, that's not right. We're just faced with two inconsistent approaches. Yes. We don't have one I, tribunal. I, I, and I'd accept... The difference in the other. Yes. If, if you were truly presented with disagreeing specialist tribunals, particularly two, three judge panels, um, then it, obviously you, you wouldn't be able to, um, the first question would be, well, which one do we defer to? Um, but what I've argued is that in fact, there's no tension between them, uh, between the ratios of each. Um, and uh, the, uh, where the upper tribunal says, uh, 
that it wouldn't have followed IB if it was a decision of the, the Court of Appeal. Um, my submission is that it, it's not attempting to insult the, uh, uh, the, the higher court, but it's simply saying um, that it, its ratio isn't uh, inconsistent with its own. The, 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 the high court judge and two experienced social security judges who sat on Hockley know perfectly well that they're bound by the ratio of a, a decision of the Court of Appeal and it, whatever they happen to think of it. Um, and uh, the, the, uh, what is clear from that comment is that they uh, thought that the, the two decisions can be reconciled. And that, that's the argument that I've advanced. Um, The, the, the third aspect of why I say the uh, appeal should be dismissed is that the Secretary of State's approach leads to unlawful uh, discrimination against persons in the circumstances of the, the Hockleys. And um, uh, I'll analyse that headline proposition by reference to the quadripartite structure that's become accepted in the, the, the fairly lengthy series of uh, human rights type cases which have uh, passed through the higher courts on, on social security. Well, I have to say, Mr. Royston, I'm a bit doubtful about all this. The Supreme Court, having gone into all the question of uh, uh, a discrimination uh, possibilities in this uh, uh, legislation, said the well, weren't any apart from the Carmichael uh, case, which has uh, been now accommodated uh, as it has been explained uh, by a new provision. Uh, are we really going to go into uh, a discrimination all over again? I think that would be trespassing on Supreme Court territory, wouldn't it? Well, what I say is that, um, that there were, I think, six cases uh, when... Um, uh, Carmichael reached the Supreme Court, 2-1, and uh, I think something like four lost. All of the four had spare rooms. There were um, the rooms that were uh, semi-occupied by visitors, not occupied at all, um, but uh, they perhaps had reasons for wanting to stay at the property. Two cases which succeeded were where people were... Um, did not have a spare room. And the Secretary of State made precisely the argument that she's making today in arguing that she should succeed in Carmichael and, and Rutherford, that the Social Security uh, legislation is, is rough and ready, that she's <coughs> entitled um, to decide not to make provision for, in Rutherford, uh, children who needed an overnight carer in Carmichael, adults who um, uh, couldn't share their uh, bedroom. Um, so I, I don't accept that the Supreme Court was surveying every possible iteration of a um, uh, case that could come before it and saying, well, we found the two, um, but um, that's it. We're now satisfied that there can't be any more. What it establishes is, firstly, that uh, the Secretary of State's legislative decisions in this area fall within the ambit of Article 8. Um, that case, along with the more recent cases, um, particularly uh, SC, uh, which is referred to by my learned friends, and also DA, which um, Mr Brown has helpfully brought copies of and then, then given to me, and I, I will hand up because I'm going to make some reference to it. Uh, DA is a decision of the Supreme Court uh, from earlier this month um, on, on the so-called benefit cap. Um, I'm going to argue that what's clear is that there is... Um, this is an area of the law which falls within the ambit of Article 8 that uh, the court must take a comparatively broad approach to whether a person has a status 
that falls within Article 14, uh, and a broad approach to whether uh, two persons are in comparable situations. And then on justification, that while the Secretary of State is given a great deal of latitude by the courts, that the test is whether her policy decisions are manifestly without reasonable foundation, that one, the courts must give those decisions careful scrutiny, and that secondly, where discrimination is said to involve children, that the court will need to consider uh, whether the Secretary of State has complied with her obligations under the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, and that uh, it might well make a measure manifestly without reasonable foundation for the Secretary of State not to be able to show substantial compliance with the UNCRC. That's the, my submission. The United Nations doesn't say that the child has an inalienable right to a separate bedroom. No, certainly, th th that's absolutely right. Where are we going? The, uh, the convention says that decisions concerning children, in decisions concerning children, their best interests must be a primary consideration, and that that has a substantive aspect and a procedural aspect. That where you're making decisions which uh, uh, affect the interests of children directly or indirectly, <coughs> The uh, legislator, at a, a general level, just like the individual decision maker, must show that uh, that decision has identified how the interests of children are engaged and weighed it with a, with a primacy. It doesn't need to be a paramount consideration. Uh, there can be other primary considerations, but it, it must be a primary consideration. Now, the, re the, the simplest respect in which there is discrimination here directly demonstrates the impact on children. If Mrs Hockley's children were in their 20s, they'd get a room each. And they, they're, um, I'm told, uh, big lads, that's not because... Uh, uh, they'll be taking up more space. It's because of, as we discussed earlier, in relation to uh, the expectations for, for men and uh, women, the, the, the legislature's decision about the uh, privacy entitlement uh, of adults in comparison with children. So the... If the Secretary of State is right about uh, what this legislation on its ordinary construction means, this measure serves to reduce the housing benefit of a family like the Hockleys with two same-sex children occupying a one-person room each and not to reduce the housing benefit of a family with two same-sex single adults occupying a one-person room each. The Secretary of State dismisses that in her supplementary scope and argument, saying, well, there isn't a discriminatory effect unless you happen to be in a property like the Hockleys. In my submission, that's not a good enough answer. That's like saying a six-foot height requirement to join the police isn't discriminatory against women unless they want to join the police. It's true, but it doesn't uh, address the focus of the discrimination. There are households like the Hockleys. Uh, in fact, it's the local authorities' case that there may be quite a lot. And in those cases, the Secretary of State accepts that she's going to be reducing the uh, amount of benefit paid to those families. And those are families who, in many cases, will already be at the 
uh, basic level of subsistence benefit. <coughs> the, um, I wonder if I might hand up um, DA because there's a couple of uh, parts of that that I'd like to take you to. Um, now, I, I'm not. Th th there's. I, I want to give you three paragraphs that I'm not going to take you to, and then and then take you to two more. Three paragraphs I'm not going to take you to are paragraphs 37, uh, which deals with ambit, 39, which deals with status, and 48, which deals with comparability. But I think. It, probably common ground that the, 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 the main focus of our dispute is likely to be about whether the Secretary of State can show this measure uh, to be justified. Um, so at paragraph 60 on page 22 of the judgment, There's a summary. Does the court have that? Paragraph 60. Humphreys and the Yes. Room. So th this is th this is part of a fairly lengthy discussion. You can see it's a it's a substantial length judgment. Um, uh, the, the court is essentially saying here that Humphreys gives the right test. Um, in the course of rejecting arguments by the claimants in these cases uh, that, that are, are, are more, uh, a stricter test should apply. Um, the test is whether the rule is manifestly without reasonable foundation, but it needs careful scrutiny. 60. And then... At 78... is a key part of the analysis of the relevance of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, and the court accepts that in a case where uh, there's, on the face of it, discrimination against children, and, it, and in the instant case, it, it, it's in a much starker form than found in uh, the, uh, the benefit cap decision. Here, there is children have inferior rights to numbers of rooms to adults. And the court says... When you're conducting the Article 14 with Article 8 analysis, you've got to assess whether there was a breach of Article 3 of the Convention. And at the end of that paragraph, a foundation for the decision not made in substantial compliance with Article 3 might well be manifestly unreasonable. So, where, we ask, is the analysis that this measure will lead to children being in households where the uh, 
the benefit is reduced in circumstances where it wouldn't with adults. Because remember that uh, this is a measure that was introduced without transitional protection for people already claiming or already living in their properties. The Hockleys were allocated this property because it seemed a sensible place for them to live. They had, ironically, been in a two-bedroom property before that. They were put here, and then the bedroom tax came into force afterwards. And they've suffered a significant period of time after they made an unsuccessful application for a discretionary housing payment until the local authority conceded that it needed to fit, that it would pay DHP during the currency of these proceedings. Spent a significant period of time with a reduced income in circumstances where if the Hockley children were adults, they wouldn't. I invite you to turn, then, to page 34 of the supplementary bundle. Which is the Equality Impact Assessment. which was conducted in relation to this measure. I'm sorry, which... Um, so, sorry, um, uh, uh, tab two. And the... So the age analysis begins at power 51. Three paragraphs on age, which carries over to page 35. The age analysis is conducted entirely from the perspective of the age of the lead claimant. It doesn't look at the effects on children at all. Can, can I just clarify one point? Because it seems to me you could put this in two different ways. Um, what is the discrimination? You put it in two ways. Uh, firstly, that you, you said children have a right to an inferior number of rooms compared with adults. Uh, and you put it uh, in terms of children, or at least a family with children in it, um, uh, have the have the right to reduce benefit. Yes. Um, well, well, the first is a step along the road to the second, I suppose, um, because if the Secretary of State is right about paragraph uh, sub paragraph five of B thirteen, then. Uh, the Hockley boys get one room where two adult sons would get two. But, but, but I, thought, I thought you said earlier in your submission that as a matter of policy, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with two young children sharing a bedroom. Maybe something wrong with two adults sharing a bedroom because of privacy and all sorts of other things. But what so I say is... There's no detriment. The, the, there is nothing wrong with them sharing a bedroom which accommodates them. But if I'm wrong on my primary argument, and my primary argument is that the legislation is sufficiently sensitive to ensure that they're only treated as uh, uh, having their entitlement discharged by one bedroom if it fits them. But if I'm wrong about that, and in fact that the legislation is rougher and readier than 
the upper tribunal said it is. And in fact, their entitlement can be discharged by just one bedroom that doesn't fit the requirements. Uh, that, that, that analysis is just completely wrong. The, the, the regulations don't do that. Uh, the, the regulations say uh, abs there's absolutely nothing wrong with these two boys living in the house that they currently live in. But if they live in that house, they'll put it for reduction in housing benefits. Nobody's requiring them. The regulations don't require that these two boys to live in any specific property, uh, yeah. let alone this one. But it, it, the reason why there's a discriminatory effect is because their family's benefit is reduced by 14%. Well, that's the, sec that's the, that's yes. the second way that you put it. So it's the first way you put it, not a, not a... Do you put it in the first way or not? Well, I, I, I must confess, I, I, I haven't... I, I, I'm not sure I followed your Lordship's... Uh, I, I can see that I, I haven't persuaded your lordship that uh, there is a problem. In the, the, the regulations do not require anybody to live in any property. The regulations yeah. concern housing benefits, yes. which is a benefit. Yeah. Um, so it, it seems to me that if there is any um, uh, discrimination here, uh, the detriment is in terms of the re re reduced housing benefits. Well, I, I, I'm content to, as I say, I, I, I'd really pointed to the first only to say that it's a, that's how you end up with, that nobody really minds what the mechanics of this regulation do or, you know, what, what entitlement it, it says they have. And I, I, I think I had, I think I may understand your lordship's point, that it, it doesn't matter what it says about uh, the number of rooms that they're entitled to. What ultimately matters is the money that the family come out with at the end. Um, but yes, the, the argument in my submission works <coughs> that way, um, that the family with the two children in it has less money than the family with two adults in it. Has the Secretary of State considered that? My submission. No, she hasn't. Um, let alone has she considered uh, the Uh, uh, factor as a primary consideration. And so although this is, this is on the hypothesis that, that, that I'm wrong on my first point, if I'm wrong on my first point and the Secretary of State was trying to affect a policy which encouraged people to move out of misoccupied instead of underoccupied property. She needed to think, well, that policy is all very well, but it's going to fall particularly, you know, for the people who, as a result, suffer financial disadvantage, that's going to fall particularly on children. And, in fact, there is no evidence that um, that featured at all in her reasoning. So <coughs> the, conclusion that, that this is a policy which is bad for children because it's particularly liable to put children in the difficult scenario where they're uh, seeing their benefit reduced, they can't get a lodger in, uh, they probably have a house that's not very attractive for a swap because by definition these, these rooms are tiny, not a particularly nice version of a, 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 a three-bedroom house if, if the rooms are so small. Um, 
that's going to fall particularly on children because adults um, don't have that problem because unless it can accommodate, the Secretary of State accepts that unless a room can accommodate a person, it's not a bedroom. Not suggesting that anything with four walls um, uh, will do and that uh, you can treat something as a bedroom if you can uh, have an uh, adult standing up in a broom cupboard. Um, this interpretation has ne causes negative financial effects, primarily for children. Um, the failure to grapple with that and weigh that, in my submission, means that the uh, on careful scrutiny, uh, the, the discrimination is uh, seen to be unjustified. From that, what I say is that it follows that uh, Section 3 Human Rights Act requires the court, if it possibly can, to interpret the legislation to avoid that undesirable outcome. And uh, I don't understand either of my opponents to say that my um, construction or the upper tribunal's construction is simply impossible, even taking into account the, the very vigorous interpretive uh, My understanding of Mr. Brown's submission is, is his submission is that it's unambiguous, uh, but um, uh, uh, unambiguously um, uh, to the um, uh, determination of the other tribunal can be public law. Yes, um, and I, I, I don't think it will be in dispute between us that ambiguity isn't required if the Section 3 Human Rights Act duty is, uh, is engaged. So the, 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 uh, the, the benchmark is whether it's possible, and I, I don't understand. You know, I do say there's no way you can separately read this legislation. Ah, well, I, I, um, th th that's not an argument that um, I previously encountered. If uh, if the court thought that, well, I mean, the, the, because that's not previously been argued by the Secretary of State. Um, that's not something on which you have submissions from either side. Um, it's also a rather thorny area of law because I, there would then be complicated submissions about whether the court could just disapply the uh, offending regulation or, or whether it couldn't, and the Supreme Court's going to be considering that later. Um, I, I think if the court found itself in that position, you know, I invite it to invite further submissions uh, from both sides. But uh, my primary submission is that we don't need to go there. This, this simply reinforces my uh, primary submission that the, the right way to construe this legislation is that it takes money off your benefit if you have a spare room. And if you don't have a spare room, it doesn't. Um, I don't know if I can be of any further um, assistance. If, if I may, I'll just consult with my solicitor. Yes, well, thank you very much. And th that's everything that I'd like to say. Thank you. Very briefly, my Lord, if I may. We say that there is actually only one point in this appeal, which is the statutory interpretation of the point. And you're right that I the Secretary of State's interpretation, or you will prefer the upper tribunal's interpretation. And to be clear, even if my own friends were right on discrimination, is no way you could read Section 3 uh, power in order to uh, make this actually language yield in the way that he suggests. So if I can just make effectively two points, and the first is statutory interpretation. And if I can invite the court just to have a hand again, E13, just returning to the point my Lord Lord Justice Hickenbotham was discussing with my learned friend about the, uh, the entitled to one bedroom submission paragraph 5. So my own friend says, Secretary of State has a difficulty because the language there is the claimant is entitled to one bedroom and the court said one has to understand the context to which that entitlement arises. And we say, as I said before, that is right because what my own friend failed to do is put paragraph 5 in the context of paragraphs 1 and 2 of B13. It forms part of an overall scheme it is not a freestanding provision. Now, as I talk the court through in detail, 
when one looks at one, two, and five, one sees immediately that this is a scheme for calculating rent entitlement and rent assistance. So in paragraph one, the maximum rent social sector is determined in accordance with paragraph two to four. Then at 2a, b, and five, the sort of critical parts of the formula, the relevant authority must determine limited rent by determining the eligible rent. That's a. Then B, where the number of bedrooms in the dwelling exceeds the number of bedrooms to which the claimant is entitled in accordance with paragraph 5. So one sees from B13 to B what the purpose of the entitlement to bedrooms is. And it's not, as my learned friends would have it, a freestanding entitlement to a bedroom. It is an entitlement to a bedroom as a proxy or a means of determining rent. So that is clear from B13 to B, which then what refers to paragraph 5. So when one reads the opening words of paragraph 5, the claimant claim is entitled to one bedroom for each of the following categories of person. That is for the purpose of determining the rent as calculated under paragraph 2. So that gives effect to all of the structure of the scheme rather than part of it. That is our overarching submission. The court has my submissions on uh, the, the effect of paragraph 5. It is notable that my learned friend accepts the principle that one looks at the bedrooms as vacant, so the property as vacant, and one depersonalises each of the categories in paragraph 5. That acceptance means it is not possible to interpret this legislation in any other way than the Secretary of State interprets it. So it is a depersonalised assessment that gives effect to the social policy, in particular, and under occupancy overcrowding. So that's all I wanted to say about the statute, but we say it is clear. On discrimination, one has to bear in mind what was decided in Carmichael. Because as the court has identified, there were in fact two successful claimants in that case, the Carmichaels and the Rutherfords. They succeeded not because of a freestanding discrimination claim, but because of the analogy of their circumstances with the earlier case of Bernard and Gorry. So Bernard and Gorry had established that it was unlawfully discriminatory not to make provision for adults who required an overnight carer and children who could not share. So they were the facts of Burnett on the, on the one hand and Gorry on the other. What the Supreme Court found in Carmichael is that that has to apply to the corresponding adult and children in each situation. So if you have adults that cannot share, they're in the same position as the Gorries. And if you have children who require an overnight carer, that's the Rutherford case, they're in the same position as the earlier Burnett case. So the, the Supreme Court said there's an inexplicable inconsistency in the scheme because it makes provision for one but not the other. And it's effectively just a rationality finding by the scheme having done one thing following the Burnett judgment got to, got to deliver the logic of that and <coughs> make equivalent provision for each of the counterparts and that's how they're described. So it's not the case that there is still scope for simply reviewing different discrimination arguments uh, simply because the Carmichael and the Rutherford case claims it succeeded. But ultimately what the Supreme Court has held is that the policy of reducing entitlement, i.e. the percentage reduction, is lawful, notwithstanding the impact on affected claimants, and that is all affected claimants. It considered it, with, uh, as one would expect, with the most difficult cases, those severe disability cases, and the Supreme Court concluded that the overall point <coughs> in general terms is lawful. So when my Lord Lord Justice Longmore says that the submission trespasses on the Supreme Court, it, it, it totally trespasses on upon it, because the Supreme Court has considered the arguments in detail, and it has found that the policy has a reasonable foundation, because of 
wider social policy objectives at its significance. So even if there were prima facie differential treatment here, we would be able to say, by reference to Carmichael, it is justified, that's the end of the analysis, and there's simply no scope for this argument. But the way that my learned friend puts it, doesn't actually disclose anything which is recognisable as differential treatment. Because he says, well, children are treated differently from adults who share. Well, well they are, but that isn't recognisable as being discrimination, because my law would just take a bit, there's no detriment there, because it is well understood that an adult couple presents with a different set of needs from a child couple. So that the scheme recognises that and makes different provision for adults against children. So there is simply no starting point for the discrimination claim here. Now, simply to say, well, children um, who cannot share are subject to the measure. That, that's not actually right. The difficulty that my learned friend has here is that he can't escape from the fact that it is wisteria way which is the problem here. There's nothing about their family unit which results in discrimination. It's their family unit in situ, in wisteria way, which isn't adequate for their needs, which results in the application of the percentage reduction. Um, but in, in discrimination terms, that means that the differential treatment is not done on the grounds of age, or status of being a child, or status of being an adult, or anything of that nature. It's done on the basis of their living in a property which is inappropriate for their needs. So we go back to the same point, which is that the legislation isn't intended to allow people to occupy any particular property. Once that is accepted, then there's no discrimination here at all. Because the statutory entitlement to bedrooms corresponds to what Parliament considers to be the needs of the family unit. And those needs can be properly met with another property. So even if the court were minded to entertain the respondents' notice arguments that this is discriminatory, we would say that they just don't get off the starting block. There's nothing for you to uh, require Section 3 to, to interpret. The legislation as it stands is perfectly clear. It doesn't give rise to any unlawful discrimination at all. And so for those reasons, we invite you to allow this. I think one matter that... Uh, uh uh, Mr. Royston raised in connection with uh, Mrs. Carmichael was that the decision did proceed on the basis that uh, uh, her room uh, was not satisfactory for her purposes and therefore there was discrimination. And I think the thinking is uh, that therefore it does show that you do look for the purpose of this legislation at whether the room is. Uh, uh, fit for the purpose of the person occupying it. Yes, so we accept that when one reads in the amending provisions, then there is a departure from the general principle that one looks simply at blueprints and things like that. So the amendments, post Carmichael, post Burnett, etc., require a decision maker to look at certain fact specific situations, such as does the adult require an overnight carer? Can the children share a bedroom because of medical needs? Can the adult share a bedroom because of medical needs? So, yes, the, the pure starting point uh, disappears to some extent, and the policy then brings in certain exceptions, but it's only very limited exceptions in the particular instances that have been uh, built into the legislation following the Burnett decision and following Carl Michael. There certainly isn't a freestanding power on the part of the decision maker to start looking at any set of circumstances and any situation whereby there's a mismatch between actual person occupying the bedroom and the characteristics of the bedroom. So it, it is limited to effectively those specific examples and no others. Right. The, 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 um, my understanding of the case, both Gorry and Carmine, the, the, the point in those cases was that in Gorry, um, you couldn't have these children sharing a room. The room could be this big, but yes. they couldn't share uh, because of behavioural problems. Yes. Carmichael, 
they couldn't share because Correct. of the um, Mrs. Carmichael medical condition, no matter how big the room. Indeed. It, it, it wasn't saying Mrs. Carmichael can't share this bedroom because it's not <coughs> big enough. Uh, that's exactly right. And I, I can tell the court what the medical reasons are. I don't think it's going to assist, but Mrs. Carmichael could not share a room because of those medical needs. And it doesn't matter if, in fact, it was a large studio type apartment. So that was the basis on which the, the case was litigated. And it's also that, that's what Lord Dawson said. It, yes, ab absolutely, my Lord. So it is a red herring. If the point had been, well, actually, she could share, but in a different room, then the case would have been argued on that basis. But it, that, that <coughs> isn't, in fact, a factual position, that they, they couldn't share. Right one. Uh, anything else? Uh, well, thank you very much for your uh, uh, arguments. Uh, we will uh, reserve judgment in this matter. We don't find it at all an easy case. Uh, and uh, you will uh, uh, receive uh, a draft in the usual way. Uh, we'll be grateful for uh, uh, typographical corrections, but uh, no others. And uh, uh, anything further, consequent on uh, the uh, uh, judgment by way of uh, further submissions uh, will be in writing. But uh, thank you all three of you for your very well-focused arguments. Well,